Welcome everyone. Oh, welcome. This is Mobile Strategy with Jason Burke and yeah, Jason. <laughs> Jason is, uh, been, has owned a, a, a great web development company down in Northampton, Massachusetts called Gravity Switch since uh, 15 years ago. A really long time. Um, he is currently uh, working with Drupal and WordPress. And are you still doing your custom CMS? Not so much. No. Not so much. He had a custom CMS for a long time. Uh, and they are building a very large, very um, complicated, but really easy to use websites. And uh, Jason's been doing a lot of work in the mobile space and um, teaching people about how to think about mobile for quite a while. And I'm really looking forward to this. Cool. So thank you, Jason. No pressure, right? Okay. <laughs> So, um, yes, I hit. just want to feel for people in the room. Um, what's your mobile experience? How many one stars in the room? Don't be shy. I won't be holding against you. Two stars. Three stars. Four stars. There's like two. Okay, that's all good. Um, okay, so people are pretty evenly split between one and three for people that didn't see the results there. One, two, and three. So, um, web experience. Any one stars? Hoping not. Two stars? There's Mark, yeah. <laughs> Uh, three stars, four stars. And so that's pretty heavily weighted to the three and four stars and some two stars thrown in too, just so you guys know what results we're getting for who's in the room Good when you're talking to people over lunch. Um, so raise your hand when, I'm going to say name out the terms, raise your hand when uh, any apply to you. Uh, tech geeks, that's a lot of them, go figure. Designers, a lot of them too, they're about equal. Content person, even more it looked like, that's weird. Managers. A lot. And other? Is there anything that I'm <laughs> is there anything specific I should take note of in the room, or are we good with? Okay. Strategists. What was that? Strategists. How many people are strategists? Oh, yeah. Four and a half. Don't know what that means. Um, okay, so I have a philosophy of technology, and um, the philosophy is that technology does not solve problems. And the example that I tend to use for this is um, is Windows. I mean, they spent ten billion dollars on this stuff, and we're all happy for it, right? And, and you know, I mean, ten billion dollars is a lot of a lot of technology to throw at a problem. Um, it, in my mind, technology is a supporting role. And um, I don't know anyone's familiar with lean manufacturing, but Toyota really took over the automotive industry, and the way they did that is they fundamentally. Um, rethought of how people make cars. And what they look for is they look for waste in the system and they take out waste and they always want to do things more efficiently. Their policy of technology is don't implement technology till the process works without technology. And it's, it's a really, it's a good metaphor. When, when possible, I even try to apply that to web projects. If someone wants some sort of fancy whiz-bang feature, my first thought is, is there like a hack we can do to prove that people actually use this feature? If we can, if we can prove it in five hours, that people will either use it or not use it. We know how much money and time to invest in it. And so I feel that pretty strongly. Um, I also think the simplest solution is best. And there's two reasons for this. One is just cost and time. Um, but the second reason is because um, the less moving parts you have, the less that can break. And, um, and so anytime you can streamline more with less, more with less, more with less is something that I always, always encourage people to look at. Now I want to point out for the people that raised their hands about tech geeks in here, I'm also a big believer in personality traits. People are, the people that are the happiest are people that know what they do best and are doing that sort of thing every day. And that doesn't mean every second of every day, because there's stuff we have to do that we're not good at or we don't love doing. Programmers inherently are people that like complexity. If you're a good programmer, you like complexity. And so this idea of finding the simplest solution doesn't always, doesn't always come naturally to programmers. And so it's something where um, I'm a big fan of also being cross-disciplinary. So whenever possible, put people in the room that have a counterpoint to that. And you say, yeah, I can build something. I can have it in two days. It'll have all these features. Have someone in the room with you that can, if you know you're that type of person, don't try to turn yourself into a different type of person. But work with people that are going to provide a counterbalance of that. And that's, I think, one of the dangers that Microsoft gets into. They get a bunch of people that are wicked, wicked smart. My wife worked at Microsoft. The people there are awesome. They're smart. They're dedicated. They really, I mean, they really know their, their stuff there. Um, but they're, they're very much geeks. And so you put them in a room, and they would rather solve a complex problem than an easy problem. If you give them an easy problem, they're going to try to turn it into a complex problem. And that's something just to be aware of in our own personalities, in our own day to day. Um, so I, 
I, I encourage people not to go there. And so as I'm talking about mobile a little, you're going to see this philosophy that I have kind of coming into it. Um, so, you know, what is mobile? And, and yes, those are Apple-centric you know, pictures, but don't, you know, that was an old slide. And yeah, uh, sorry. Um, the, the reason I bring these two up is because I want to point out that when you're talking about a tablet, the tablet is really a similar web experience to desktops. And as you're thinking about how you interact with things, when you're on your iPad, you're browsing a web page, you don't need a mobile version that's in a narrow copy. But when you're on your Android phone or Blackberry or, or iPhone, you, you need to start thinking about things differently. And so technically an iPad or a Kindle Fire or one of the other tablets out there that has like a 85% market share. Um, and, and right now Kindle Fire has I believe that's the last numbers I saw, about a quarter of the market share, and the iPad has the other 75%, and there's like literally like four or five percent that are shared by all the other tablets in the world. So now I'm, I know I'm up to 105, I'm rounding off here. Um, but when you're designing mobile, what you're really talking about is mobile, handheld, phone-esque devices. Um, and so that's just kind of an important thing to kind of keep in mind in terms of where you set stuff. Um, because the phones have a really tiny web experience, and that, that old experience that we had kind of crammed onto a phone doesn't always work. Um, so some of you have seen parts of this slide before, but even so, feel free to chime in. Talk, tell me a little about how mobile usability is different. So again, we're talking, in terms of mobile, I'm talking specifically of phone-sized devices. Shout out some of the things that you know that are different about it. I think one of the specifics is that oftentimes we're looking for an immediate solution. You know, we need to find something, we need some information on something, we don't really go into browser mode. You're standing in the street here, usually. Yeah, yeah. And it's location-based, I think, is something that's important. What else? You can also only go so small. Fingers will get all jumbled up on the Yeah, seriously. I mean, the, the size of it is a huge thing. Um, the portability, the fact that you have it on every street corner. What else? A lot of different gestures. A lot of different gestures. A lot of other ways to interact with it. I don't have that on a bullet, but that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, it seems more like image-based or graphic in terms of navigation. It's more graphic and image-based in terms of how you do things, which has an interesting counterpoint because um, the bandwidth starts to matter again. I mean, I don't know how many people were here when we had to design websites for dial-up connections. But yeah, there's, there's a lot more graphical stuff, but those, that graphical has a cost. and um, I don't know if you guys know, but the new Apple iPhones and iPads have twice the resolution, and if you don't update your website to have twice the resolution graphics, then you can see the difference. And as more and more of those get rolled out into the world, you're going to be saying, okay, well, I want the image to be twice the resolution, and because it's a quadrant, it's actually four times the resolution, which means four times the file size. And for those of you that live in Vermont and New Hampshire, you know that four <laughs> times the weight on a mobile phone sucks. Yes. I mean, it just sucks, right? So, um, so I mean, that's an important thing. I, you know, personal goes back to your point. I mean, it's me right here, right now. Um, I have this interesting slide that's not in my deck that that plots the number of people that search for mobile phones and the number of people that search for social media on Google Trends at the same time, and the two lines completely and totally mirror each other. Like year after year, they both grow at the same exact rate, which is not a coincidence at all. Um, the other thing about mobile is it's interrupted. I mean, kind of going back to your point, and you kind of probably summed up more succinctly than some of these sub points that I've pulled out, but this idea of, um, you know, you're doing it while you're at an intersection, and you know, you're not supposed to, but you do. You're doing it when you're, um, I mean, I'm sure someone here, there's someone right there, and it's mobile looking at something, and then he's gonna look up and look at me, because I'm talking to him, and that's part <laughs> of the experience. You don't do that with your desktop. I mean, unless you have really annoying office office mates. You, that, that's a, it's a totally different workflow. Um, and then going back to this idea of small buttons, typing sucks on mobile. I mean, whether you have a keyboard, you don't have a keyboard, you have big fingers, you have little fingers, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmarish experience. I'll just add one more point, and I think yeah. probably falls into personal, but for those of us who are getting older, these things get harder and harder to see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Seriously. Okay. I was, I was just going to say, along with the, the typing sessions, you also don't have any buffering. Yeah, that was a fun one, too. When we first started designing for mobile, when, when you're on the website, 
um, you have a navigation item and you figure out what it's gonna look like. There, there's basically, there's the standard state. So there's a button, there's a button when you roll over it, there's a button when you press it down, and there's a button when, you, when, you're, when it's active. So you go to the page and then the button's glowing, the navigation item's glowing. So there's basically been four states of user interaction for 20 years now. And the hover doesn't exist, and the down state hardly exists because your darn finger's over it. So the down state, could, I mean, you could just make the button disappear for all practical purposes, and most of the time people wouldn't notice. I mean, it's really, it's really a new thing. <laughs> the truth is, usability is still the same. Um, content is king. Why did you go to Walmart? Because you wanted information. You didn't go to Walmart because you're like, hey, Walmart's fun. Maybe they have a game for me to play. I mean, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, you still have to start with your goals. I mean, this is, this is the same thing with the website. Where, what are people trying to do? What do we want people to do? Maybe they're not the same things. Um, you need to know your users and test, so don't assume. So, you know, test and analytics. I probably should be more specific about that. Look at the results of what people do when they go there. I mean, it's quite possible that Walmart looked at it and said, look, 0.005% of the people that come to our mobile site really want to find hours and location. They're a lower priority. This is the way we're going to deal with that. I don't think that's what they did. <laughs> I also think that a smarter way to do it would be to put locations and hours in the footer as words. I mean, they, they could still solve that problem in smarter ways, and I'm certainly not defending their horrible, horrible solution. Um, <laughs> know your budget. I mean, this is the same thing with websites. I'm sure you guys have websites where you start out and it's like, there's this old joke, and I don't know if I might be dating myself by saying it, but it's like, what if um, web design was like architecture? Someone would come up and say, you know, I want a house and I want it to be as big as my neighbor's down the street, and I want it to have the indoor pool like that other guy across there, and I want this fence, and you know, they're pretty easy to articulate. So can you just throw them all in there, and I want it at half the price than, um, than this person paid for this trailer over here. And that, you know, that's kind of the philosophy of web design. Mobile's the same thing, and so the same strategies that apply to figuring out mobile usability, you gotta pick your battles. There's no way you're gonna test on 762 mobile devices. So how do you prioritize that? Where do you go with that? Our rule of thumb at Gravity Switch is it needs to look okay if it's 5% of your market share or more, and it needs to look good. But no, it, it needs to look good if it's 5% or more, and it needs to look legible if it's 2%. And so we just look at analytics for every client and we say, okay, mobile is, you know, some of our clients is as high as 30 or 40%, banks especially. And then we look at it and we take any of the specific um, phones or devices that are in the top, you know, 2 to 5% of their total audience and we test specifically on those. Does someone have a nine-year-old Blackberry that barely gets the web and it might blow up? Yeah, but you, you, gotta, you gotta know what your budget is. Um, and understand your wins. So um, again, going back to this idea of programmers kind of overbuilding stuff, there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot of geek features you can throw in there that really don't matter. And so just make sure you're being smart with how you're using your budget in terms of what your successes are. Um, and then of course measure results. Okay, so for those of you that's had enough of the abstract <laughs> and want to talk about something a little more specific. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are a couple of tools that I use to check out mobile experiences. And one of them obviously is, is I'll, I'll just use my iPhone or Android phone or um, any of these mobile devices. But anyone that's a Mac user may or may not know this already, but you can download developer Xcode from Apple for free and it includes a simulator. And the reason it includes a simulator is so that you can make iPhone applications and then test them without actually having to go to an iPhone. And it is a rock solid simulator. Um, I mean, it's supported by Apple, it is really awesome. It also has a web browser though. So I don't do any Xcode development at all, but I keep the simulator on my, on my machine because I can easily go in and read morbid headlines anytime I want. Um, and I can see how any site behaves on an iPhone very, very easily. And this is, it, it's completely and totally rock solid. Another, um, another tool that we use periodically is Ripple, which is, a, which is the BlackBerry equivalent of it. And it's, it's free to download on either platform. Um, you can go in and change which, which device you're looking at. You can see it in all different ways. 
Um, there's also some simulators for Android. I don't have one installed on my machine because every time I install it, I'll wait like a week and it will be out of sync and it'll stop working and I have to install a new one. If anyone knows of good Android simulators, tweet to, uh, tweet to what's, the, what's the code for? JD12NE. JD12NE. Um, and, um, and then we can share it and get it around. Android simulators are a bit harder, so we usually tend to use real world devices. The other tool that, um, that we've started using, and the jury's still out on whether it's a good tool or to use or not, is Adobe Shadow. Has anyone checked that out yet? It's, it's a fairly new tool, and, um, and it has horrible directions for how to install. But the theory behind it is you can, you can match up two devices. So error connecting, tap to retry. Yeah, it has some issues if you change. Um, oh, maybe I have to add, hold on. Forget it. So the, the way it works, the way it was working for me yesterday, and people in the office have played around with it a little, is you can go to a, you can go to a page in Google Chrome if you have the plugin, and whenever you go to the page, your phone goes to the same page. And you can run on Android, it can run on iPhone, so you can have six different devices in front of you. you turn on Adobe Shadow on all of them, go to your browser here and they all turn and then you can sit and look at them and then you go to a different page on your, and it's just a lot easier to navigate. There's less of the small buttons and that. Um, jury's still out as to whether the overhead of setting it up, as you saw, which isn't completely painless yet, um, is worth the, the time saving. But, uh, okay, any questions about any of that? What was the, again, I'm sorry, what was for Apple? It's Xcode, it's free from Apple, yeah. Okay, so. I have a nifty handout. I don't know if I have enough, but I'll do my best. Can I ask someone to just kind of, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm going to keep one. So how many people know what responsive design is? OK. So responsive design is, is, is a geek's dream, OK? This is a responsive design site. Boston Globe is by far the best example of responsive design. And what happens is when you go to a different size monitor, it starts to do smart things. It's the same exact code, and you just use CSS to do, in quotes, the right thing. So they've made, they've made choices. So watch the navigation while I scroll it down. Okay, so it gets smaller, it gets smaller. Boom, now it changes to a subset of the navigation, a smart subset. This is all conscious. You get even smaller, it becomes an even smart, smaller <coughs> subset. Smaller. You can see it, it grows, watch these, the search <coughs> box, for instance, starts out as a search box, and then somewhere along the way just turns into a search icon, and that's an example of a good icon to have. I mean, just to put out there, I mean, people can figure out that means search. Um, hey Jason, can I just interject? Yeah. Uh, on, on the website, jimladaynewengland.org, if you take a look at Jason's talk, there is a PDF of this handout because we have run out. Um, and you can download it from there. And someone can take this last one on the way out the door too. Yeah. I just wanted it in case I could hold it up and talk about it. Um, so responsive, responsive design is just a really, really neat concept. Um, it can be done very, very well. Um, you know, that's, that's Boston Globe. This is a site that we did that's responsive. Um, it's, a, it's a college. And at, you'll see as it gets smaller and smaller, the navigation starts doing different things. And you know, you can see the image disappeared because once you get to a smaller, you just want to get to the facts. You're, you're no longer kind of browsing. You really need to get to the information quicker. Um, this is one that we did. Um, in general, responsive design, we find ads between 30 and 100% to the design and development time. So it's not, it's not without cost. There's ways to do responsive design very badly. That's quick and easy and cheap. <laughs> but the actual thought patterns that go behind it, I mean, you can, technically you can have responsive design just move objects around. But at some point you need to think about it and you need to say at what screen size, like notice the image is shrinking. Like the image shrinks, 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 shrinks. And then you can see the font for the text for real world results also shrinks at a certain point. And then, at some point, the whole image just disappears. And someone has to make those choices. You have to try it at different sizes. You need to figure out where you're going with that. Um, it is more work. Have other people experienced this with responsive design that it adds, I mean, does 20 to 100% sound reasonable based on your experiences? Um, 20 to 100%? 
20 to 100 percent in, in addition. So if the design and programming of a site takes 50 hours, then it'll increase that by 20 to 50 percent. 20 to 100 percent. Uh, 10 to 100? I'm sorry, I was just messing with you. You said 20 to 100. It's like the only, the only place it goes up there. Well, so no, so okay, so if it takes 50, 50 hours to design and program a site, um, it'll, it'll be anywhere up to 100 hours to design and program a responsive site. So it'll increase the amount of time by 100%. Are you factoring in on the uh, uh, changes you have to make to the client's uh, process or the internal company process to adjust for that as well, or just the, product, just the actual product? Just, can you hold that thought, and if I haven't responded to it later, because I want to talk about the difference between a responsive site and a non-responsive site, and when you should do them well, and why they're smart ideas. And I think I'll answer that question sideways, but if not, call me on it. Um, the other thing about responsive, though, is you can do it very, very, very badly. And let me see if I can find an example of that. So here's a perfect example of Google, geeks, programmers, overthinking things. They've designed a responsive site. And when it gets smaller, I mean, why, what is going on there? Like, that is not a, that's not a, I mean, look at, change language is now overlap. Like, it, it, it's just an utter mess. And so technically, this is a perfect example of how not to make a responsive site. I mean, I'm not sure what their goals were. I'm not sure if they had goals. I mean, if you think about what they've done, they've started out and someone said, responsive is a cool technology. We're gonna go and add that technology. This is the snippets of code we need to fix that problem. It's gonna be great on mobile. In this case, they would have actually been better off not having a responsive site. Um, let me give you an example of someone that doesn't have a responsive site. Um, Apple computers does not have a responsive site. If you go to Apple, hold on, I bookmarked a lot of these. Um, if you go to Apple on an iPhone, this is what it looks like. And I mean, can anyone here say with authority that Apple does not understand mobile? I mean, <laughs> seriously? I mean, they are the company that, that out of all companies in the world, should understand mobile, and they've made a conscious decision to do this. They have an app in the store, and at the moment, Apple wants people to buy ads. Well, so at on the that moment, too, yeah. it's not even this responsive thing. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you let's say, hypothetically, there's some people on an Android phone right now, and they're, they're frustrated with it, and they're thinking of buying an Apple phone. What are they going to do? They're going to go to the Apple site, and they're going to do it on their phone. This is the experience they're going to have, and this is a conscious decision. And I. Whether you like or dislike Apple, I think it's safe to say they make pretty strong strategic decisions with a purpose behind it. And so the point I want to bring up here about Apple is not necessarily Apple doesn't do this or Apple does do this and you should follow suit. But the point I want to bring up is deciding to leave your mobile experience identical to your non-mobile experience is a perfectly valid way to approach the web. This is not a bad solution. This is a perfectly valid solution. Let me give you an example of another site. Um, New York Times is pretty well thought of as the media company that really gets mobile and has successfully um, started to transition its business into a company that makes money on mobile and on the web. In, in, the, in the past three weeks, I think, there's been half a dozen articles out there in places like Wired and, and other places that have basically said, New York Times is the most successful company when it comes to digital, digital newspapers. And all the other newspapers are kind of like learning from them and scrambling to catch up to them. New York Times does not have a mobile view that comes up automatically. You know, they do have a mobile page if you can find it. Last time I tried to find it, I couldn't, so I finally just gave back up on it. But, um, but they've made a conscious decision. So, We've talked about two different ways to handle the mobile experience. One way is to create a responsive site, which takes a bit of work. The other way, on the other end of the spectrum, is do nothing differently. And I think one of the key takeaways you guys should take with you is they're both very valid answers in different situations. And so, um, any questions about that? Anyone want to fight me on that? Well, is, is a third way to make an app, then, uh, just, just to get to that question. And if you are going to develop for mobile, are you going to do one or the other, or are you going to do both? Are you going to make a responsive site and make an app, or are you, yeah. again, I, that may get back to your question about know, know what your budget is. 
Um, so there's, a, there's a third way in between there. Not just make an app, but make a mobile specific site. And that's what I want to talk about next. Um, and, and I can say, in most cases, a mobile app is not the way to go. Unless you're intentionally trying to get people to download more apps, in general, on a global sense, <laughs> it's a very frustrating experience. So if you're on, a, if you're on the mobile site, and let me see if that will still. So if you're on the mobile site and you go to Apple, whoops, it's absolutely not Apple. You go to Apple and then you click on the store. Let's see if they still do it. They tell you go download an app. That's, I mean, they are they are doing that specifically because they want to encourage people to install mobile applications. That's a business decision. Now if there aren't many companies in the world that would want to do that. Amazon, Samsung, Apple, might be one or two others in there. Um, HTC, someone like that, that specifically want to drive people to their app store. Um, I don't think the app's the way to go, but there is another option, and the other option is to make a custom, um, a custom page that's specifically tailored towards what those people need, which is probably very different from what normal web browsers. And so if we take a look at eBay, for instance, eBay is not a responsive website. You make it smaller, it does not get smaller. You look at the navigation of eBay, there's this whole navigation stream, there's this whole navigation stream. They've gone in and consciously come up with a different way to interact with eBay, specifically for mobile users. Um, and so, you know, you have to work on browse categories to start browsing. You know, they, they've broken it down completely and totally differently. Right? Is this distinction making sense between an app or responsive and a, a web-specific web page? Oh, just in this example, doesn't it have to be somewhat responsive for different, uh, <coughs> different phones? I mean, even if it's at just the smartphone? Uh, um, that's, a question. that's a great question. That's a great question. To some degree, but there's something like, and I don't have the exact numbers, but if you design for iPhone size, I'm not saying design for iPhone, I'm not trying to start a war here, design for iPhone size, you're getting about, in terms of width at least, about 80% of the mobile devices out there, which is kind of the starting point. And there does have to be some degree of flexibility in there. Most of the devices have come to realize that if they want things to look good, their browsers have to do the dirty work. And so that's not to say they'll all do that. So, I mean, if we go to Ripple right here, um, and we go to eBay, yep, they fail on the BlackBerry Pearl 9100. That's, a, that's, that's something that they, they haven't. And so there's two, there's two things going on there. They might have looked at, looked at their mobile site on the BlackBerry Pearl and said, and the BlackBerry Pearls not work in mobile. We're just going to send those people to the main site. Or they might have not written their code. They, they probably, more likely, they probably have code on eBay that says, hey, if you have an iPhone or these seven popular Android models, do this. Everything else, forget it. This is a small enough percentage of our traffic that we really don't care about these users as much. And this, again, goes back to smart. I mean, companies like eBay, when they lose customers, when they lose users, they lose lots of dollars. And so they're very incentivized to stay up with this. I'm sure they're looking at their market stats to figure out what their most popular thing, popular browsers are. Is this all, any questions? Keep, keep the questions coming. I have more things to show, but. Yeah, as another alternative for mobile design, what are your thoughts on using something like jQuery mobile? I mean. Or maybe it's a down and dirty. I think, it's, I think it's the wrong answer. I think it's the wrong answer for multiple reasons. So. Let me, let me show you another example. Um, St. Paul School. This was an example I, I kind of sent around the office in prepping for this talk. I said, give me some good examples of responsive, non-responsive, and sites that have custom mobile experiences. And, and just kind of send them around. And one of the programmers sent me this site. And I said, this is the coolest site. It is so awesome. It is so great. And so when you go here, the reason they like it is that's pretty slick, right? Did you see what happened? I mean, that's cool stuff, right? But, hello, there we go. Here's what you see when you go to it on a BlackBerry. 
So what you see is a search box and about St. Paul's and this part of an ugly picture that's not laid out in any sort of smart way. And what they did was they started with the assumption that we want, here's the website, we want to keep parts of the brand identity intact so people know they're in the same place when it shrinks and we want to do something nifty with responsive. I don't think it's a net gain from a branding point of view, from a coding point of view, or from a usability point of view, because when you look at, we do a lot of work in higher education, when you look at what people want when they go to websites in higher education versus when they're on a website on their mobile device, I mean, anyone that's gone to a college lately, what do you need on your mobile device? You need directions, you need someone's phone number because you're running late, you need, um, if you're a student, you want to check your application status, no one's going to go and apply online on their mobile phone. They might do it on an iPad. Again, iPad's like a desktop. Um, but they're not going to go and apply. They're not going to, they might browse through a list of majors, but they're not going to go through every little detail and fill out every single form. And you want to have access to that sort of stuff. But having a custom navigation, I mean, again, if you go back to what's here, you come to this site, the first thing you want to do is you want to, you want to get directions. You know, how do you get there? Where do you, let's see, da, 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 I'm looking for direction. This is not doing what I thought it would do. I'm having a little trouble using it also, so that's, that's my issue, the jerky scrolls. Contact, maybe? And this is great, too. So now I'm trying to contact, it's the wrong place. Now where's the navigation? <laughs> All the way at the bottom on the interior pages. Again, having a link at the top of the page that said menu, that did some kind of cool fly out would be much, much more powerful. So not only do they not have the right information there, but they're not, they're not presenting it in a good way at all. Questions? I feel like I'm being a little negative, and I'm not trying to be negative. I think this is all really positive. I, you know, I, I think for so much of the interface design, and we've seen this for years, is you have to put yourself in the shoes of your users. And, you know, the idea of thinking of, of uh, you know, high school students who are looking for a college and they're in a car with their parents trying to get information, I don't want to start there. What do you need exactly. to you know, and set a criteria and a priority list and, and, and structure it that way. Who cares what the original website looks like? That's not the audience. Do you guys, does anyone here know Amy Stevens? She actually went through one of the programs here. So Amy was working at um, MCLA and we were working with them on their website and they wanted them work a mobile site and we started working on it and they looked at their statistics. She is wicked smart too, by the way. She's like one of the smartest people so if you ever get a chance to meet her, you should meet her and take her out to lunch. This is not Amy Steven from Joomla. This is another Amy okay. Steven from Joomla. <laughs> Sorry. Who well, also may be very smart. I don't know. She's also very smart. We're <laughs> um, talking about so, her. So we're working with them. You know, part of our contract is designing a mobile site. We start working on the mobile site. She looks at the stats. She realizes that they're in the Berkshires. And so if you guys think you have bad cell reception in some places in Vermont, you know, add more hills in the middle of it, and it gets worse. So their mobile traffic was completely and totally negligible. So we started working on the mobile site, because of course it's a state school and that's in the contract and we're building that. So she just flips it on its head and she says, but you know what? The students, on-campus people that are on the on-campus networks are on mobile devices quite often. So she turned the, the mobile site into an on-campus portal for students. So it has quick links to their email, to their Blackboard. Um, I, this one blew me away. It has quick links to webcams in the laundry rooms of the dorms. So if you're on the third floor, you know whether you can go down and get some, before you carry all your laundry down, five flights of stairs, the elevators are always broken in those dorms. Um, I mean, really, really smart. Again, going back to who are your users, how are they going to use this, where is a smart place to land um, So the challenge with, I also want to point out the challenge. So this goes back to your content question and your maintenance and your upkeep question. One of, the reasons people, one of the reasons people like responsive designs is by their nature, the navigation, the content is identical. So let's take the Boston Globe for an example. Um, the Boston Globe, which as an aside, is wholly owned by the New York Times. So it's likely that the New York Times is, is, is testing stuff with the Boston Globe and eventually the New York Times will also be responsive in the same way. Um, if you go and add an article to the Boston Globe, you just add it to the CMS, and it's instantly in the um, it's instantly on the mobile site as well as the other one because it's responsive. It's all the same thing. If you change the navigation, the same thing happens. You add something. Let's see. If we go, if we open it up a little, and we look at here's the sections: Metro, Arts, Business. Because it's responsive, 
metro arts, business, it has the same sections. These things are intrinsically tied together. So from a, going back to your question, from a client workflow point of view, if it's responsive, and this is the beauty of responsive, it shouldn't matter, <coughs> okay? Um, where it starts to get more expensive is if you have a completely different navigation for your mobile site. So I talked about for a college, for instance, you want directions, you want to find people, you have an intranet. This, this is a whole different navigation. It's a whole other bunch of content. And maybe there's some overlap. And people have to smartly put them in different places. Um, but it does, it does increase the complexity of the content. But it does serve the users better. So I want to quickly show this little handout that I have. So one thing I want to add kind of going over this whole thing is if you don't use mobile, don't try to design mobile. Sure, you can program it if someone tells you what to do there. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen plenty of cases where, I'm not even going to go into it, but if you don't use mobile, don't try to design mobile. First, use it for a while. So the first thing I recommend people do is look at their site and look at the traffic. And how many people use analytics regularly to make decisions? Yeah. That's good. So it's like 50%. It should be up to 70%. You gotta keep moving that number up. Because because analytics will tell you what's smart and what's not smart very, very quickly and easily. So first question is do more than five percent of your users or over five hundred visitors visit the site every day that are on a mobile device? If the answer is no, um, unless your boss asks for it and specifically mandates it happen. You don't need a mobile site. You might still, as an organization, decide to have a mobile site. There are other political reasons or other reasons to have it. But the fact of the matter is, if it's a small percentage of your users, you can just do what Apple and New York Times do. I mean, they're obviously, I'm sure they're losing money, or possibly they're losing money. But you know, the scale of it is just not, not relevant for you. If it is more than 5%, now you really have to yeah. I'm just curious how you uh, address the case where you have uh, a lot of people who would use your site in mobile the unusable mobile if you have a boss that doesn't get that. That's what it seems like that's that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, Four-hour work week, what's that guy's name? Tim Ferriss. Tim yeah. Ferriss. He seems like a little bit of a dick. Not someone yeah. I'd ever want to admit. Yeah. But uh, me, but um, he has some really good thoughts. And, and here's what he says about, about that. He says, hey, how many of you would buy this awesome thing? Half of you will raise your hands. And then he says, for $19.99, and it's still 40% raising their hands. And then he says, and I can take your credit cards right now, and there's two people left in the room. I don't believe that build it and they will come. I mean, that was the whole philosophy of the dot com. Okay. I mean, we will build this technology and people will use the site, and my boss just doesn't get it. If you want your boss to get it, say, hey, boss, we get this many people that come to using mobile devices and leave instantly. We are losing those customers right now. And if that number doesn't convince the boss, to be perfectly candid, you need to back off and admit that, that, that there's not a valid audience for your website in mobile. Um, and if you can find a reason, maybe, I mean, here's another example. And here's why I'm saying there's exceptions to everything. You might look at it and say, hey, only 1% of the people that come to our website, which, which turns out to be 34 people a day, or whatever that happens to be, it's a fairly small website, um, or maybe it's 300 people a day, whatever, come to the site on mobile. But 90% of them go straight to this section. And this section is where we make our most revenue. These people are decision makers. These are the people that are paying the bills. These people are really important. That's a perfectly valid case to make, too. But again, go to the analytics. If the analytics don't prove it, then figure out how to make the analytics prove it. And if you can't, face the reality. You don't need a more complex solution. Yeah. It's a little bit maybe on an experience I had with mobile where, it, and I can't remember the slide, it was during the Super Bowl, and I was trying to look up our dress-up. <laughs> and you know, I'm in the middle of the store, and I'm looking for the recipe because I, I can't remember the ingredients. I want to make sure I get So I, I type in the recipe of what I need, and I go to the like food network. And they wouldn't let me get past their damn Super Bowl. Uh, mobile app that they had set up. Every, Every page it says download a mobile app. I download a mobile app. I couldn't get past. Look, it, it was just that it automatically switched to this mobile application, and I could not find the icon. I could not find a way to get past it because it wasn't giving me what I wanted. Obviously, I was yeah. not making 
a popular Super Bowl item. They had all the chicken wings and everything listed there yeah. was for Super Bowl, but they didn't have what I wanted. They had pumpkin pie. Yeah. So um, I couldn't get past. So it was like automatically changing from something that I did not want, and I. And that's where analytics can tell you can tell you good results too. I mean, at some point they consciously said, "Look at the Super Bowl app on," and if they look at their stats, and so there's one of two things happening. Okay, either that design choice was good for them or bad for them. Whether it was good or bad for you personally is a little secondary, right? So if they're smart, what they did is they is they rolled that out and they watched their analytics over the next two days and they looked at their abandonment. And if you look at the abandonment rate for the two days before and the two days after they made that change, what are the ratios? And it's pretty simple. They either made a good choice or a bad choice. And again, I keep going back to analytics. Analytics can answer that question. And yeah, they might lose a lot of business in those two days. But they'll find out after two days and be able to fix it. I am a huge fan of being agile, failing quickly, but measuring those results. Um, Amazon. So when Amazon rolls out a change to their website, I might have said this to people before. How do people know how long they roll out a change to test it to look at the statistics for it? Yeah. Other guesses? No. Keep going. Oh, there a minute. <laughs> Keep going. Five minutes. Keep going. Five minutes. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Did they have that much traffic? One second, and they get statistically relevant results. What? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talking with someone who worked on the Amazon team, and she said whenever they have a change, they put it into the pipeline, they run it for one second on Amazon, and they analyze the results. And if those results can show more money at the end of the day, then they polish it up and they run a couple more longer tests. <laughs> one second is their first test. They get a roll of which They're built. They're built for it, right? I mean, and and so when it comes down to someone that knows how to maximize results um, on the web, Amazon. I mean, they're like. They're like the gods of watching their numbers. Um, I mean, if you look at Amazon, the number of clicks it takes you to, to buy something from Amazon is very carefully calculated. It's not, I mean, buy.com tries to make as few clicks as possible, or at least they used to have been there forever. Amazon actually wants you to click a couple more times. And the reason for that is because they can say, hey, the new Harry Potter book's out, or the new you know, Hunger Games, or like whatever you, and they know enough about you, they know what to actually put in that list. I mean, every time you do an extra click on Amazon, a chance you might buy something else. And they can statistically say, if you have to click five times, then enough people give up that it's not worthwhile. But four times, they make enough upsells that it's a, it's a net gain. I mean, it's all about those numbers. And I'm not saying they made the right choice. I'm not saying Food Network did the right thing. But if they were smart, what they would have done is turned it on for, for two days. And if, if I were them, I would have actually been monitoring it during the Super Bowl, too, because it's a time of high traffic. And I would, I, would, I would have gone in, I would have, on the day of the Super Bowl, I would have sat down and I would have had six metrics I would have been looking for. And if they changed the percentage of click-throughs, um, blah, 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 changed to blah, 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 we'd roll back to whatever. I would have all this, it, that's, that's the way I think I'm kind of game that way. I got a question that's following on her example. Yeah. She was pushing the Super Bowl app on her. So wouldn't her, you know, going to the Super Bowl app unintentionally up the uh, the analytics for that app, even though she didn't want to be there, she was there. Well they so I wasn't there for that long. So. Right. We didn't click on anything either. And you were there, there, there the whole time you were looking for things. Well I was there and I said, damn you, off oh. and then I would look and try somebody else and then I went back for some other reason just I think I went back to say surely there's a there's an icon in here that right. looks kind of like a compass maybe <laughs> <laughs> I can bypass this damn thing which is highly entertaining and go to their regular website so I may have gone a couple times but I wasn't there very long because I also know that if I don't like it I don't want but your point is her going there and now skews the numbers. And right, that was my point. Exactly. I mean, Mark Twain, we'll quote him again, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. So you need to be careful about what you're measuring. But, you know, or Steve Krug. Everyone's read Steve Krug. Don't, don't make anything, right? If you haven't, go read it. It's the best book on usability ever. Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. It's the easiest read in the world. Um, what he says is test often and great, great with a huge grain of salt. And so, you know, if you look at it and you say, that's great, we downloaded all these apps, you say, yeah, but some of them really aren't going to use the apps. Okay, well, a couple things you can do. You can put analytics in the apps and see what the return rate is on the apps. Um, I mean, or you can just say, you know, we get, we're, we've downloaded 10 times as many apps. This is t 
totally worthwhile because now we're going to pump to the most downloaded on the app store. It's going to turn into more apps. We've got the paid version. We're converting this many people from the paid app. That's totally worthwhile. Your recipe, sorry, it just does not matter to us because this is turning into dollars and cents for our app. That's a conscious decision that people can make. Let me just add one thing to that, if I may. Yeah. One of the challenges, especially if you're developing sites for other people, yeah. is getting them on the right page. Um, and, and I've been in, in uh, internet advertising for the last 15 years, and I have had conversations with clients where you get on the phone and they are unhappy because they're not getting a 6% click-through rate on their banner ad. You know, and that doesn't happen in the real world, so they have expectations. So managing their expectations is a big part of it. But I think to this case, if you're doing development for somebody else, you have to sit down and say, by the way, tricking people into clicking on things so you can up your analytics and make it look good is a fool's errand anyway. You really need to say, what are our objectives here? What is it we really want to accomplish in the long run? And focus on those. And sometimes it's really just your role to educate your clients so they, because they don't see it through your eyes. They're just doing what they think they need to. And sometimes that's what they need to do to get to the next step. I mean, I, we definitely have clients where they come in with a stupid job, and we, we look them in the eye and say, you know what, you're wasting your money. And they say, that might be true, but if I show success with this with my boss, then I can get the budget to do the right thing next quarter. And that's not the ideal situation to be in, but that's, that's reality, right? I mean, how many people have experienced something like that where you're knowingly doing something um, just to get to the next step? Um, so I, I want to hit a couple more points here. So. So assuming that at least 5% or 500 visitors a day are coming to your site on mobile, the next question you should ask yourself is, do the mobile users access the same content as non-mobile users? And there's, there's three options here, yes, no, and I don't know. And if the answer is I don't know, you really need to start looking at your analytics. And sometimes that also means changing your web page so you're asking the right questions. Um, I'm going to give you an example of this, and it's not necessarily a, um, a mobile example, but we were working with Dartmouth School of Engineering. Um, and one of the questions we had is, do people click on for alumni, for students, for parents, for guidance counselors, like those sorts of links, or do they just go straight to academics? And um, you can answer that globally, and we have statistics that say 80% of the time people go to just academics or admissions or something like that. But on a college by college basis, I mean, the engineers think differently. <laughs> The engineers that are applying to Dartmouth think differently. I mean, it's a very, very select group. And instead of trying to generalize that, as we were working on redesigning their site, what we did is we just put a banner across the top of their existing old site that had those links. And then we just looked at the click through. And I forget exactly which one, but what we found is one of those links actually got clicked on quite a bit, and the rest of them didn't get clicked on. And very easy to learn that sort of stuff. So again, um, if you think you're looking at it in mobile places, people are going places, but they're not where you'd expect them to go, Figure out how you can put a test in there to prove it quickly and cheaply and easily. And, and usually there's enough flexibility in design. I mean, you don't want to destroy your brand by doing it. But well, take the Walmart example, for instance. I mean, if they had the question, huh, maybe we could get you know, people to the right place. Maybe more people would click on this location if we just changed the word location in hours. They can just put location at, in hours at the bottom of the footer. And literally, Walmart, I'm sure, gets enough mobile traffic that within two or three days, they can statistically say whether they're better off having an icon or having a link at the bottom. And I have, I have strong ideas on it. Jen has strong ideas on it. Maybe we're both wrong. I mean, we've been wrong before, right? Yep. And so go for <laughs> analytics. Go for analytics. Know your users. Test often. Um, where'd my little handout go? So, um, so the real question is, do they have the same experience? And if the answer is no, they don't have the same experience, if, if mobile users don't have the same experience, you really should design for the most popular devices to have a custom site that's specifically for them, not a responsive site. So, um, so again, going back to what eBay does, as opposed to what, um, I mean, here's some other, and I'm not endorsing any politicians, I'm just, here's, here's just an example of a responsive site that's gotten a lot of buzz in the development community. As it gets smaller and smaller, you see it. But all the content's still there. I mean, this, making college more affordable, learn more, it's the same content that's up here somewhere, except it shows more information when it's bigger. So as it gets smaller, it's just doing the, the right thing. So from a content point of view, it's actually very easy for people on this campaign to go in and, um, and change the content. Um, I also wanted to mention there are apps out there, there are web pages out there like Responsinator, which, um, which tries to render it. They're actually pretty poor, and this, had this up because it was a perfect example of it not working. 
The first site I brought up here was the Obama site, not because, again, not advocating, but just it was the first on my list that someone sent me. And the first time I went here, menu was overlapping login, even though it really wasn't on the iPhone. And it's supposed to simulate an iPhone. My recommendation is don't use web-based um, on-the-fly rendering things like Responsinator to figure out what things look like. Use an actual simulator whenever possible. Um, what other examples? Okay, so, so if you need custom navigation and should have a custom theme, you should design for the devices that are there. And so <clears throat> I usually say at that point, again, go back to your analytics. So go to your analytics, figure out what devices are over 5% and design for all of them. Keeping in mind, again, that in most cases, an iPad is treated like a desktop. And the, and the one key place that an iPad's not treated like a desktop computer is when there's a lot of typing. Because typing's still not as easy on an iPad as it is on a, on a real keyboard. So you want to think about like how many forms you have, how do you click through things. The, the multi-select on an iPad is, is very weak. I'm surprised it still exists that way. Um, so if, if it turns out that people do need different things, then, um, then make a custom page in the same way that eBay has a custom page. And it might be fed by some of the stuff. Here's the, the Dartmouth site I was talking about. We went in and said, you know what, they have, they have different needs for their mobile users. And we went in and specifically designed a site so that all the buttons are above the fold. I mean, these are, these are engineers, just the facts, ma'am, sort of people. And so how do we get, how do we make sure that, I mean, if they went to this site on a mobile device, we could make it responsive somehow, but we want it to be direct. We want it to get there on the mobile and boom, boom, that's, that's your information. On the other hand, if your mobile users are accessing the same content, like the Boston Globe, I mean, when you go to the Boston Globe, you want to read news stories. <laughs> if you go to the website or the mobile device, it's the same thing. Um, in that case, you have a choice of whether you want to do responsive or custom. eBay, if you go to eBay, mobile users are probably doing pretty similar things to, to desktop users, which is obsessively checking your sales or obsessively buying things. Um, and, but but it's, the same, it's the same workflow, but they have chosen to make a separate, separate device. So it, you, you have that choice if you're in that, in that spectrum. Um, so questions, we have about seven minutes. Questions, we can look at sites, get ideas, or? Uh, I wanted to think about the This is a great question. This is hopefully, does this question make sense to people? I mean, couldn't hear it. Okay, so the question was, what about content? So regardless of whether you choose responsive or non-responsive, do people want the same information on the About Us page? I mean, that's a really darn good question. And it's a question that there's not, I'm not gonna give you the answer for. You know, it's, that's the question that you really should be asking, and that's kind of the point. And the two things you're juggling are, Cost and there's upfront cost, but there's upkeep cost too. If you have, if you have duplicate content, if you have two contact pages and two about pages and two this pages, and a phone number changes and you have to change it in four places, that's that's money. I mean, that's that's money and errors and that's that's bad stuff. On the other hand, if they really need different information, that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind and think about how you're going to handle it. And so. That's really the crux of the question. And does that also affect like SEO? You know, I'm probably going to get booed out of the room, but SEO is dead. Unless you have millions and millions of dollars, you can't successfully compete in that world. There are exceptions. I'm sure in this room there's two people that can actually do really well with organic search engine placement. But over the past five years, it's become such an oversaturated market that um, it's, it's not a good investment. If you're trying to come up when someone looks for bagels downtown Brattleboro, Vermont, right. just put those words in your website and you're good to go. Like it's no, not, not, there's no keyword research, there's no rocket science there. It'll take five minutes, let's just move on. Next. <laughs> you know? <I'm laughs> okay, you mentioned that SEO is dead, but some of the, the basics of SEO, like, um, well, we mentioned Flash earlier, you know, search engines don't read Flash very well. So, so do the basics still stay in? Of SEO? Yeah, for SEO. 
I mean, I was at a conference a year and a half ago with a company that um, basically their model in 2000 is they said, if people don't understand keywords, what we're going to do is we're going to find products that people search for that don't get good results, and we're going to dominate all of their keywords. And this company does more business than Amazon. It is a venture-funded, self-owned company that does more online sales than Amazon by basically grabbing all those nooks. And what they said a year and a half ago is at this point, they're 90% paid AdWords because they, they, they and other people like them have saturated the organic keyword market. And, and, and the return on investment on that is so minimal, it's cheaper to buy AdWords now. And I mean, these are people that literally created a multi-billion dollar industry out of, out of search engine optimization. And they said, you know, that time passed, that was 2008 was really the last year that that, that, that was on the uptick and it's been on the down, down swing since then. I mean, don't use Flash. I mean, that's just right. a no-brainer anyway. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in the concept of mobile first? That's what you design. No, unless, you're, unless your analytics are over 50%. Okay, so as far as responsive templates. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, go back to responsive yeah, yeah. templates. Design for mobile first, and then using CSS3, as your screen, screen width gets wider, then you change things, which do you? So the question is, do, you, do I believe in mobile first for responsive? So let's say you go down this pie chart and you decide to do responsive. There's a, there's a movement out there to start by designing for mobile and then figure out what happens when you get bigger. Um, I think that's a great learning tool. I don't think that's that's the right development. I think that's a good geek tool because geeks have more fun than mobile. Um, <laughs> but unless your market share is over 50% of mobile, you should be focusing on the 50% of your market share and then figure out how to cost effectively get the best experience back to the other people. I'm, I'm sure you're getting this. I'm very numbers driven. You know, if you can prove to me mathematically that this is the core of the market, that's what I'm going to recommend. And, and that was part of my question because if, if it's only five or ten percent of market share, why would you start there? Exactly. Yeah, if it's five percent of the market share, why would you start there? From a learning point of view, that's not a bad thing. Though. I mean, I, what I would do. We're very, very agile shops, so um, we did a we did a college website, TCI College. Um, Eighty percent of the work was done in three days. We went down to New York. We had a full team on it. We um, took photos, we did the design, got it signed off by their board, trained 15 people on their staff, created about 40 pages of signed off or almost signed off content, another 40 pages were put in place for the framework, took about a month to get the rest of the content, went live, we won a very, very prestigious national design award for it, and, um, and they increased their leads by 50% without increasing traffic to the site, and so that's, that's a month worth of work. So I think very, very quickly, if I was in a position where I needed to learn mobile, we're doing a mobile site, what I would probably do is I would do two two-day projects. I would do one this week and one next week. And I would redesign the website mobile first, and I would redesign the website desktop first. And then I would sit down after that and objectively look at which results the best and possibly merge them together. And it's, and it's a great learning experience. So if you're new to mobile, I think doing a mobile first experience would be great. I wouldn't pin the whole results of the final project. You find if you're designing a mobile site and you're kind of looking at the, the being more spare because there's there's less yeah. bandwidth. Do you find that sometimes that design element really translates well to the the main site and you know basically providing a very streamlined approach, not too verbose, etc. You know, it almost is a jumping off point of let's yeah. make it as, as, as yeah. quick and, and painless as possible. Well. I mean it depends. I mean we do 30, 40% of our business is in higher education. They like their words, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so conceptually, yes, but again, it all has to do with the specifics. Who are your users for this site today? Now, don't even pretend you know what they're gonna be tomorrow, and who cares what they were yesterday? What are they today? Um, so I'm gonna get cut off right now. I can hang around afterwards. I do have cards somewhere I can find them. And um, I'm around for lunch, so gather around. I'm open to any questions you have. I'm obviously very passionate and psyched about all this stuff. And he likes it when people like challenge him and yeah. say, you're tell wrong. Me I'm wrong. Yeah. So tell him you're wrong. Okay, thank you, Jason.